The Avro Vulcan was one of Britain's first nuclear capable bombers. The Vulcan used an incredibly unique large delta wing design allowing it to fly faster and at a higher altitude than enemy interception methods, making it the most advanced V-class bomber in the Royal Air Force arsenal at the time. The Vulcan also creates an unmistakable sound that drove fear into the Soviets and Argentinians when it ran real bombing runs with conventional weapons. Today we delve into the once top secret files of the Avro Vulcan. The invention of nuclear weapons and the bombers that would carry them. In 1913, prolific English author of The War of the Worlds, H.G. Wells, published his novel The World Set Free, in which he popularised the science fiction idea of an atomic bomb. However, it wouldn't take long for that nightmare to become a reality. Less than 20 years later, in 1932, the subatomic particle known as the neutron was discovered at the Cavendish Laboratory at the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom. Within 10 years of the discovery, scientists found that nuclear fission could output unbelievable amounts of energy, and Britain quickly began their own nuclear weapons project codenamed Tube Alloys. Soon afterward, in 1943, the US and UK signed the Quebec Agreement, which enabled both countries to work together to develop nuclear weapons. The countries were sworn to secrecy and promised not to use nukes against each other. The agreement also stipulated that both countries had to reach a consensus if either was planning to use the weapons on the battlefield. Three years later and the Energy Act of 1946 ended that cooperation prematurely, leaving Britain exposed to Soviet aggression. The British were suddenly under pressure to develop their own warheads and the delivery systems for the bombs. The early requirements for nuclear armed bombers were for these first planes to fly at least a 4,000 nautical mile round trip with a cruising speed of 575 miles per hour at an altitude of roughly 40,000 feet, and it needed a weapons bay capable of housing a 10,000 pound bomb. Four companies were selected to submit designs for this new bomber and Avro won. Avro got its start in Brownsfield Mill in Manchester with its founders Elliot Verdon Rowe and Humphrey Verdon Rowe. Humphrey was an entrepreneur who helped fund Avro in the early days and he also founded Britain's first birth control clinic. Elliot was a pilot who started modelling airplanes in the early 1900s and by 1907 he was test flying his own experimental models. Elliot, Humphrey and their team were prolific and fast-working engineers, creating close to 100 planes during the company's relatively short lifespan. Avro's early works included the Avro 504, which was a training plane used during World War I, and the company designs quickly modernised, with the Avro Lancaster, a heavy bomber powered by four Rolls-Royce Merlin XX V12 liquid-cooled piston engines. Avro's winning design for this new top-secret bomber was testing delta wings. These wing shapes are mostly triangular compared to the modest tapers on the leading edge of conventional planes. The invention of the jet engine finally made delta wings a viable option, as these wings required supersonic speed to do their job keeping the plane aloft. At subsonic speeds, delta wings create flow separation, which increases pressure drag, and that increase in drag could cause spontaneous loss of lift and even stalling mid-flight. However, with a higher angle of attack and at higher speeds, these wings provided a number of advantages over the conventional designs of most World War II era planes that used swept or straight leading edge designs. Delta wings are stiffer and stronger than other wings because of their increased surface area, and that increased area also makes more internal room for larger fuel capacity. This shape would later pay off by decreasing the plane's radar cross-section, making it stealthier than other planes of its era, before planes were even being designed around stealth. The new design team would also research crescent wings in case the delta wing design ended up failing. Crescent wings more closely resembled the swept wing, but crescent wings could theoretically fix stalling problems and improve transonic speeds, by spreading the aerofoil curvature over the full length of the wing. After several adaptations of the design, the Royal Air Force brought in two competitors to Avro, Vickers Armstrong with their Vickers Valiant and the Short brothers Short SA-4 Sperrin. 
Together, the three nuclear-capable planes would be known as B-bombers, and the UK Nuclear Strike Force would become known as the B-force, or the main force. Avro faced an uphill battle with the Vulcan. The team, led by Roy Chadwick and Stuart Davies, were given no information about high-speed flight innovations from either the UK or the US, which resulted in them crafting an initial model that was close to double the weight limit required by the RAF. Then, only a year after work began on the new plane, Chadwick, the technical director of the programme, died after the Avro Type 688 Tudor II prototype crashed. Production was delayed once again when Avro was forced to retest their updated thinner wings, and that meant that although Vickers Armstrong were late to the party, their Valiant model was the first plane produced in the V-Bomber project. To test the new wing design, Avro built the 707, which was a one-third scale model designed to test low-speed handling, and they built the 710 to test high-speed flight. After removing the tail and the supporting fuselage from the 707 in later iterations, they were still 50% overweight. The 710 was later cancelled because it was deemed too costly and time-consuming. Instead, Avro made the 707A to test high-speed handling, but the first 707A crashed one month after it was made, killing the chief test pilot Samuel Eric Esler. Throughout the testing phase, the original Vulcan wing had its leading angle widened, and additional angles were also added. By phase 2C, the wing was wider and longer than the original, and the trailing edge was swept. The Avro Vulcan The Vulcan was certified, and production began with 15 B1 models. These first versions were powered by the Rolls-Royce Olympus 101 Axial Flow two-spool turbojets that had a maximum thrust of 11,000 pounds of force. These early Vulcans would get two engine overhauls, upgrading to the Olympus 102 and 104, increasing the thrust per engine to 13,500 pounds of force. But by the end of their life cycle, the Vulcans were running Olympus 200 series and 301 models that could output 20,000 pounds of thrust. The Vulcans' engines were placed in pairs of two on either side of the center line of the plane. The plane also had uniquely narrow intakes that were in the wings of the craft because it lacked a traditional fuselage. A close engine configuration coupled with the narrow intakes created the iconic Vulcan howl when the engines were running at 90% power or higher. Early Vulcan models were using anti-flash white paint that could reflect portions of thermal radiation emitted from nuclear blasts to protect the plane and the pilots. The Vulcan held a five-person crew within a two-tier pressurized cabin. The pilot and co-pilot were stationed on the top floor with Martin Baker 3K ejection seats, while the bottom floor held an air electronics officer, a navigator radar controller and a navigator plotter, who could bail from the plane's rear-facing entrance door. The decision to opt out of ejection seats for three of the plane's operators added another source of controversy for the Vulcan. The Vulcan was equipped with a T-4 Blue Devil bomb site, which allowed the plane to attack moving targets and avoid the predictable downwind path required by less sophisticated course-setting systems. However, the B-1 was only equipped with traditional flight instruments, like the MK-4 Artificial Horizon and the G-4B Compass. For weapons, the Vulcan could carry 21 1,000-pound bombs for conventional attacks. Early Vulcans carried the Blue Danube, Britain's first nuclear weapon. Blue Danube was a gravity bomb that was the smallest possible yield of technology at the time with a blast of 10 to 12 kilotons. They would later carry Britain's first tactical nuke, Redbeard, and the US-supplied MK5. Later versions would also carry the Green Grass, or Violet Club, which upped the blast yield to 400 kilotons. Eventually, in 1962, the B-2 variants were given the Blue Steel Missile, which was equipped with the Red Snow W-28 1.1 megaton nuke. Blue Steel was a standoff missile designed to attack targets from a distance, similarly to the ALBMs. Blue Steel missiles were provided significant advantage over the early gravity bombs as they could travel at speeds of over Mach 3 and they could attack targets outside of the range of surface-to-air missile defence systems. In 1956, design work began on the Vulcan B-2 to accommodate larger engines, reach higher combat ceilings 
and improve mission capabilities with in-flight refueling technology. The B-2 would also add ECM or electronic countermeasure equipment. The first B-2 flew with Olympus 201 engines upping the thrust to 17,000 pounds of force. The Vulcan was highly specialized and its models lacked defensive capabilities, although blue steel could be used for defense under the right circumstances. A third major variant was almost produced. Dubbed the Vulcan Phase 6 or B-3, this new plane would have a 121-foot wingspan to improve carrying capacity to up to 339,000 pounds and improve fuel capacity, which would extend its flight time to 12 hours. The B-3 would also carry six Skybolt missiles. The Douglas GAM-87 Skybolt was an experimental air-launched ballistic missile, or ALBM, that was developed by the United States. Skybolt could be launched over 1,000 miles away from targets, making the launch planes well outside the range of Soviet defences. Each Skybolt would have been fitted with the W-59 lightweight nuclear warhead capable of outputting a blast yield of 800 kilotons of TNT. However, the US opted for submarine-launched missiles with ICBMs stationed at ground bases instead of the air launch varieties and cancelled work on the project while the UK continued to test the Skybolt. Eventually, the UK purchased the Polaris submarine launch missile and cancelled work on the Skybolt, which led to the cancellation of the Vulcan B-3. The Vulcans go to war. Ten years after the Vulcans entered service, squads of Vulcans took part in Operation Sky Shield exercises in North America, the Vulcans were deployed in Singapore during the CETO operation, or Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, to undergo joint exercises. There, the Vulcans trained for both nuclear and conventional bombing runs. The Vulcans traveled to the United States for air shows and for the Strategic Air Command annual bombing and navigation competition. In 1974, Vulcans avoided United States interceptors during the Giant Voice exercise, which was a testament to the design of the plane. It was designed to outrun interceptors back in the 40s, and it was still capable of that feat 20 years after the first models left the factory. In 1982, the Falklands War between Argentina and the UK broke out over the British territories of the Falkland Islands, South Georgia and the South Sandwich Islands after Argentina invaded. The Vulcans participated in Operation Black Buck raids, during which the planes underwent seven missions that were each 6,000 nautical miles long and took a total of 16 hours from start to finish. At the time, these missions held the world record for the longest distance bombing raids. To make the trip, the Vulcans flew from the UK to Ascension Island before flying to the Falkland Islands. The decision to equip the Vulcans with in-flight refueling paid off, as each plane needed to be refueled to cover the insane distances, and over 1.1 million gallons of fuel were used for each run. The Vulcans quickly took out Port Stanley's runway, rendering the base useless. On the sixth run, one of the Vulcans broke its refueling probe, forcing it to fly to the neutral territory of Brazil. It barely made it after a mayday call allowed it to land in Rio. Despite the neutrality of Brazil, the Vulcan and the crew were detained for nine days until the war was over. In 1984, the Vulcan was removed from active service, but the Royal Air Force established the Vulcan Display Flight Unit to carry on with display flights that were piloted by volunteers to entertain crowds and showcase the history of British aviation. During these air shows, the Vulcan Howl made the plane a crowd favourite and won it millions of fans all around the world. While the Avro Vulcan is no longer in service, it will always be remembered for its devastating power, its game-changing wing design and its unmistakable sound. Have you seen a Vulcan flight display? What planes would you like to see next? Let us know in the comments section and click that like and subscribe button to catch the next video.